So it's an absolute honour to be joined by Dr. Leon Roberts. Thanks so much for coming on and chatting with me today, Leon. Yeah, you're welcome. It's not a problem. So for me, people who may not be familiar with you or your background, if you'd like to give us just a quick rundown of how you got to where you are now and the current work you're involved in. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so I started off my research training in academics at Life over in the UK. So I spent a good few years in Liverpool at John Moores University in the UK doing my undergrad and master's studies. And then I jumped ship and came all the way over to Australia to do my PhD in the area of recovery and um, looking at the cellular mechanisms underpinning that. And at the time, um, and still is in a way, one of the sort of contentious or controversial aspects of things were in relation to actual mechanisms and recovery and periodization and how and why you should do things. So I spent my PhD looking at these aspects in the, from the perspective of cold water immersion. Perfect. And that's what we're going to... I've sort of con continued that tangent of, of work now and, you know, trying to really contribute to the body, body of evidence that they, that's out there that can inevitably contribute towards some evidence-based guidelines for the use of these recovery therapies. Perfect. And that's what we're going to touch on today is the topic of cold water immersion, first of all. So everyone's familiar with cold water immersion, ice baths, these kind of modalities for recovery. But just so we put everyone on an even playing field, is there an exact definition of cold water immersion? Is there a, a maximum temperature that the water should be or an optimal temperature range that the water must be within? Yes, um, cold water immersion, it's, it's always been used as a blanket term for a number of years, you know, covering temperatures, anything from, you know, zero degrees up to, say, 15 degrees at most, um, you know, because it's one of the things that's of issue out there currently in, you know, both in research and practice is just a wide range of different protocols and everything that people use, mm -hmm. you know, all the way from using your wheel of beans with cold water and, you know, chuck, you know, 15, 20 kilos of ice into the mix all the way through until some, you know, more definitive and um, tightly regulated um, cold water immersion protocols. So whilst there's a bit of a blanket term, we are now sort of um, nailing down somewhere in the region of 10 to 15 degrees. And there's even been a, a recent review come out of that suggesting a temperature between 11 and 15 degrees for a similar um match duration is somewhere optimal but the jury's still out to be perfectly honest on that but the the complexities of things not only relate to the actual temperatures of use but also the timing you know when do you use it do you use it before exercise after exercise half time between you know halves of games or in hot environments there's so many factors that um don't make it very easy to actually nail down a specific definition for the use of cold water immersion. Brilliant. And obviously, most people listening will be familiar with cold water immersion in some sort of sense. And we know that, perceptually, it's not a nice experience. It's quite painful even for some people. But physiologically, what response do we see acutely to cold water immersion? What's kind of the initial physiological response we see while we're immersed? Yeah, so as... So, you know, many of your listeners will be able to attest to, you know, if they think back to the first time they did some sort of cold water immersion, they, you know, there's an initial sort of almost sense of panic in a way, you know, so breathing rate goes up, heart rate goes up, a little sense of panic can set in for the first couple of minutes. And that's a natural sort of fight or flight response of the body to, you know, what the hell's going on pretty much. But then that soon settles down, not only within the first session, but also as you do more and more sessions. Oh, cold water immersion um the two main sort of avenues of effect in a way and in, in relation to not only the temperature so the cold aspect of things but also during due to the um compressive nature or the hydrostatic pressure that the water exerts on you know, what the whole body or whatever um regions or aspects of the body that are being immersed at, at any given time um in relation to both of these, they you know they don't necessarily work um, separate. It's more of an integrative effect it's having on the body. Um, first of all, as you'd expect, going into some going into a cold environment of any nature, it's going to have an effect on body temperature, not only core temperature, um, but also specifically in the periphery. So in the muscles that may have been exercising, you know, arms, legs, you can certainly detect it, a large drop in these peripheral tissues and. In some instances, it's not uncommon at all for individuals to feel a bit of pain, especially in the periphery. If you think fingers, toes, 
depending on how cold the water is and also how, how long they spend in there. But decreasing temperatures of the whole body is one of the primary avenues of effect since the decrease in temperature can then have a knock-on effect on blood flow, for example. So one of the other mechanisms, you know, you're going to have a compressive nature squeezing veins and arteries. You're going to have an effect of temperature, veins are constricting veins and arteries and everything, trying to redistribute blood away from the periphery to the core to try and preserve homeostasis and maintain core temperature. So there's a big effect on both temperature and blood flow. And the interaction between these two then has consequential effects on the delivery or removal of metabolites and waste products and everything from the actual muscles. And from a recovery perspective, you know, the jury's out in terms of, okay, exactly how much of that is beneficial versus how much will then be detrimental. Um, a common thing that also occurs that a lot of people, if they think about it, sometimes they state a feeling of well-being or a bit of analgesia as far as why they would want to do it in the first instance or why they continue to do it. And whilst there's not too much evidence out there about cold water immersion specifically, just applying cold treatment to an area of the body, just using ice, yeah. we know that it decreases nerve conduction velocity as well. So if the signals are not um, being sent along the nerves as quickly, then it helps promote that sensation of analgesia, so potentially decreasing how much soreness that individuals are feeling after undertaking a therapy or two. Yeah, exactly. And it's this kind of analgesic effect that we see people prescribing cold water immersion after resistance training especially. And it's still used by a wide range of athletes, both strength and power athletes, after the resistance training. And they're told to do it for several reasons. Anecdotally, and kind of pseudoscience are told, oh, it'll remove lactate and this will prevent muscle soreness and all these kind of things. But before we go into the actual mechanistic side, from a practical perspective, what has your research shown is the impact of cold water immersion used after resistance training on our muscle adaptations to strength training? Yeah, so um, there's been a nice differentiation, differentiation in my research today in separating what we see acutely. So I'm talking, in my instance, say hours to say maximum of two days and then how that then may or may not lead to favorable adaptations in the long term so the regular use over you know a number of weeks out to three months or so mm. so one thing that has come come through and is also apparent in the other literature is that when you think about using cold water immersion acutely some in this instance i'm talking about one training session you know one exercise bout one use of the therapy, you know, within say half an hour or so afterwards, and then looking at how that influences recovery over the few days or from from the first initial hours out to about two or three days. It's very common to see reports of, you know, potentially you know, lessening or delayed in perceptions of muscle soreness. Um, that can then have a knock-on effect on muscle function. If I talk specifically about a couple of studies I've done, it's been a common theme where at, least, at minimum, a maintenance of muscle function has been seen, if not a slight promotion. So that's specifically looking at the two hours to six hour window yeah. after a typical type of training session. So what I've done in that instance is combined these muscle function measures with some biological markers. And while some of the biological markers are not necessarily lending themselves to a positive muscle function response, at that sort of acute time frame, these detrimental physiological responses aren't necessarily influencing the muscle's ability to function properly. So in the acute phase, you may see a benefit of it. Whereas when you then look at the more regular use of it, so in a training environment, for example, then it's almost as if there becomes a tipping point between what the biology says and what the muscle function is trying to do. So the body can't necessarily ignore these physiological signals for too long. So whilst acutely, you know, people feel better, so then the theory is being, if you can feel better, then maybe you perform better in your next training sessions. But overall, these physiological responses seem to snowball, which eventually leads to an inevitable attenuation of adaptation. So in, in a couple of studies that um, have come out recently, you know, this attenuation is not only how much muscle mass people are able to put on, but it also has knock-on effects on muscle function in terms of maximum strength, mm -hmm. rate of force development. You know, 
key characteristics that strength type athletes, whether they're specifically strength training for a strength based sport or even if they're just using strength training as a component of their sporting performance, you know, these muscle mass and strength characteristics are very important nonetheless. So there seems to be a differentiation there needed between whether someone wants to recover or whether someone wants to adapt and how recovery, not only just cold water immersion, but recovery in general could maybe be periodized based on what the athletes and the coaches want to get out from it. That's exactly what I was going to allude to because I remember we had Dr. James Hoffman on the show and we were talking about training and uh, recovery modalities and what we said we might be blunt in the adaptations by doing these recovery modalities that as you said it could be recovery periodization that in the off season when we want to maximize adaptations we'll leave these recovery modalities and let the physiological markers do their kind of work as you could say and then say within competition if we have two or three competitions coming up within a couple of days of each other then we can apply these recovery modalities such as cold water immersion where those long-term adaptations adapt- adaptations are not our main concern, but rather immediate recovery and immediate performance is our concern. Yeah, absolutely right. It absolutely comes down to what what does the athlete need to do, or what does what does the coach what would the coach like the athlete to be able to do? And like you say, you know, in in season, yeah, the focus isn't necessarily on adaptation so much; it's more about maintenance. You know, if you're thinking about, you know team sports schedules you know they're they're often you know game to game and then trying to recover optimally from one game to the next training session in preparation for the following games so at the end of the day in end scenarios you know whatever it takes to help the athlete recover if it's not going to be to the detriment then why not use it it's when you want to try and maximize the potential for our where the serious considerations into these modalities and how they're actually functioning should really become important since you know in in the grand scheme of things you know the effects may only be small relatively but these small effects uh you know you can't stress the importance of these very small effects in the right situation especially when it comes to the elite athletes exactly and if we delve into now the more mechanistic stuff so we know acutely there might be not that major detriment or even a benefit to cold water immersion. But as you said, the research has shown that over the longer period, if maximizing your strength and maximizing muscle hypertrophy is your main focus, cold water immersion may not be very good for you. It may be detrimental to your long-term adaptations. So if we go down to the kind of mechanistic side, and I know you've done some muscle biopsy research. So first of all, for people who are not familiar, say, well, what a muscle biopsy is, because the term that's often used uh, invasive and non-invasive uh, procedures of measuring athletes and subjects. Before we get into the mechanistic stuff, could you just quickly summarize what a muscle biopsy is and what is the benefit of doing a muscle biopsy in this kind of research? Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, very briefly, a muscle biopsy is simply the collection of a very small piece of muscle from a muscle of interest. So, for example, a lot of studies would use a lower body type exercise and thinking about areas of the lower body that are active, you know, yes, your, your calves and, and that are active in the, in the very lower limb, but the, the quadriceps are also highly active in most instances. And when it comes to sampling muscle, whilst calves have been used in the past and continue to be used, one of the most common areas to take this small piece of muscle from would be the muscle of the thigh or the vastus lateralis more often than not. So we're not talking about taking a, a massive piece of muscle. We're only talking maybe less than, you know, less than a third of a gram in most instances. And it's all done under local anesthetics. So there's no real pain associated with it, maybe a little bit of discomfort. But when we start thinking about how much detail we can get from muscle biopsies, it makes any small amount of discomfort very worthwhile from the a scientist's perspective you know we can relatively easily now and routinely take blood samples or finger prick samples from a whole host of individuals whether they're athletes or the, the sedentary but one of the questions often left unanswered if you measure something in the blood is exactly where has it come from yeah. since you know the blood's yeah. reflecting the whole systemic response Whereas with exercise in particular, especially if you've done lower body exercise, if you can sample a a small piece of muscle from a muscle group or a muscle that's been exercised, then you're able to actually investigate 
the exact mechanisms of action that have underpinned the therapy or the intervention that you've implemented. So sometimes the word, you know, the word, the word biopsy even sort of can start putting people off sometimes. You know, I, I try and, when I'm recruiting participants, I often try and refer to it as a muscle sample, like, you know, similar to a blood sample, because the preconception of a biopsy is off. Oh, Okay, that sounds painful. That sounds, you know, something I don't want to get involved with. But at the same time, the more people and, you know, there's even research that's been conducted where they've actually had athletes have muscle samples collected. And the more of these type of investigations that can be done combining these measures with muscle function, the more of a complete picture we start to paint about exactly how our exercise and recovery interventions are working. And it all boils down to trying to how definitive evidence about how to proceed in this area. Exactly. And muscle biopsies are very valuable to us because it allows us, as you said, to see exactly what's going on at the level of the muscle. So if we talk about the adaptations or the response to cold water immersion over time, we see attenuated the adaptations of muscle hypertrophy and strength. And from your muscle biopsy research, we see this is down to potentially anabolic sig signaling. So before we go into the actual results of your study, there's some kind of key words that need to be just explained to people, and that is NCAM and paired box protein. So if you'd like to explain just very briefly in layman's terms what the two of those anabolic sing signal markers are. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as, you, as you allude to, um, the, the whole domain of muscle physiology and how it underpins adaptation, especially when it comes to um, hypertrophy and resistance exercise adaptation, is very complex. You know, it's not just the one avenue that's governing everything it's it involves a multitude of different um avenues and when it comes to ncam and pax 7 for the abbreviation of the paired box protein um these are both markers that, that exist on satellite cells within the muscle so satellite cells are just um, muscle specific stem cells so while stem cells themselves are able to form any other type of cell in the body the satellite cells that we see in the muscle, they're playing a key role in muscle remodeling and adaptation to training. You know, whether that's, you know, helping repair muscle fibers that have been slightly damaged after exercise or contributing new nuclei to allow muscle fibers to grow and adapt. So both of these um, markers, about so NCAM and PAC7, are both proteins that exist on um, satellite cells so it allows us to detect um, not only the satellite cells themselves but because both of these proteins play a slightly different role in what the satellite cell does it can also help us start to tease out exactly what type of function could be could the satellite cell be doing in response to different stimuli brilliant and we know that satellite cells potentially play a very significant role in as you said muscle remodeling and muscle hypertrophy what does your research show is the effect of cold water immersion on these markers and therefore on anabolic signaling as a whole? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we'll talk about um, these two markers to begin with. Um, one of the studies that we undertook with biopsies were was taking biopsies at rest and then also two 24 and 48 hours after exercise, with the idea of looking at the two-hour marker is the you know a very acute point where we know lots of these signals are highly active, whereas the one day and two days afterwards, there's not as much information out there about how these responses develop over time. So a bit more of a time course approach to things. Um, regardless of which one of these two um, proteins we talk about, with regards to how cold water immersion influenced it. Um, to begin with, we just talked briefly about the PAC-7 response. If anything, cold water immersion in this instance actually blunted this response from occurring. So there's absolutely no change in the number of um, satellite cells expressing this protein over the 48-hour period. And that's in stark contrast to our control group, which granted was not a complete passive control. They, they just did a about a very low intensity cycling as a bit of an active warm down, mm -hmm. but we see a nice robust increase after our control condition over time. Whereas when it comes to the NCAM protein, um, a similar story existed in terms of that, um, at particularly at the, the 24 hour mark, there's potentially a blunting effect there, but what we can definitively say is that the, the response we saw in our control group started 
right from the two hour mark. Mm-hmm. Whereas after Cold War immersion, the response wasn't, you know, it was only evident at the two day mark. So mm-hmm. there's potentially a delay there in the activity of this protein and the subsequent functions that occur from its activation. So there's a bit of a combination of, you know, a slight blunting in combination with a delayed or and then a dampening response occurring. And that's similar to what we saw in another protein response. So um, some of your listeners would be aware of the mTOR pathway, for example, which is one of the key protein pathways that, you know, has, you know, it's been researched for a number of decades now. And mTOR itself is a protein that... Um, is involved in this response to, to resistance training, but more specifically, some of the proteins that um, are downstream of the mTOR protein almost play more of an important role. And in our instance, um, one of the key responses that we saw came from one of these downstream proteins called P70 S6 kinase. So this is the protein that, that its activation so how much of it is activated in the initial few hours after resistance training session right. has been shown to correlate very well with how much or the potential to have a favorable adaptation down, down the line, whether that be strength or hypertrophy. And when we looked at this protein in particular after using cold water immersion, um, first of all, at both, so there's two activation sites for this protein, protein. And regardless of which one you looked at, um, there was a, a, an enhanced effect after the control condition was implemented. So again, cold water immersion is actually having a potentially delayed in combination with a blunting type of effect here. And when we think about this type of protein, over time, you'd expect that if the body can produce more and more of this protein, there's got a greater potential for activating it as we go you know, through a training period. So what we interestingly also saw was that at the two-day mark, it was only after they did the active recovery, so only in the control group, was there actually more of this protein being made. So potentially over time, the, the cold water immersion is actually stopping as much of this protein from being generated. So if there's not as much of it there, then not yeah. as much of it can be activated, which then has you know, a cascading effect down the line for underpinning the type of hypertrophy response that we saw. So it's, it was a nice you know, couple of studies in a way where we were able to look at the acute response over two days and then also look at the training effect after 12 weeks and also have some of these muscle biopsy markers conducted after the training period as well. Mm-hmm. So whilst it would have been, you know, it would have been ideal, you know, hindsight's fantastic to say, okay, well, you know, we should have really combined both studies into mm-hmm. one, but nevertheless, we can see some insight into the acute responses, and we can see that, you know, we, we saw the attenuated muscle function and hypertrophy responses after 12 weeks, but we could also see that underpinning these type of responses were not only... Um, a blunting of an increase in muscle fiber cross-sectional area. So, uh, you know, no increase at all in the type 2 muscle fiber cross-sectional area after using cold water immersion. But also there, was, there wasn't there was an increase in the number of nuclei there in these type 2 fibers or when we combine type 1 and type 2 fibers together. So there's, there, there's a potential there for a whole host of um, anabolic-based mechanisms to be being influenced by the cold water immersion and then all contributing to this attenuation response that we've seen. Now, I won't cover old ground. I know you've had, you've had Vandre on the podcast a couple of shows ago who's an expert in the ribosomal biogenesis field. And, you know, he's some of the research that he's conducted using these samples have shown that you know, we're talking about, um, if we think about transcription and translation of proteins, you know, we're looking at the actual protein stage here in the studies that I've done, whereas Vandre's actually shown that, you know, the effects or the mechanistic effects of cold water immersion don't just start at the protein level, you know, it starts right back at the um, transcriptional level. So there's, you know, a whole host of mechanisms there that are all contributing towards potential attenuation when it's used in the long term. Yeah, and it's very nice to see the collaboration of work there. It tells the nice story right down from cellular level right through to actual practical application of muscle function. So we can see that we have this blunted response at a molecular level and that carries right through 
to what we can <coughs> see within that control group, the differences between both groups that so we see a decreased muscle function at the end of it. So I think if yeah. I was to wrap up, just to give people a very quick practical perspective that if maximizing their strength, muscular strength and muscle hypertrophy, so for any bodybuilders, powerlifters, maybe listening around when working with them, cold water immersion is probably not at this level from the evidence the very best idea to be engaging in. But if you are someone with, say, a field sport athlete that you have to maximize recovery for a 24-hour, 48 turnaround and you need another key performance, well, then cold water immersion probably is something that you could utilize if you find it beneficial. And the other kind of buzzword we see within the industry when it comes to cold water immersion and training modalities, Leon, is inflammation. We hear this thrown around that if we use cold water immersion, we can stop inflammation and First of all, we know there's a big difference between acute and chronic inflammation. That chronic inflammation is very detrimental to the body and can cause a whole uh, host of kind of complications. But acute inflammation is something that we see after resistance training. So if you could summarize quickly for us, what role does inflammation play in the response to resistance training? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so... The, the use of or how inflammation manifests itself, um, most of the early work um, was done using rodent models, so, you know, mice or rats, and they would, you know, they, unfortunately for the animal models, you know, the researchers can get away with inducing, you know, very substantial trauma to their muscles, and then to look exactly at how the inflammation responds to that. In humans, however, you know, we, we can't, necessary to go around, you know, punching people in the legs and causing, you know, large contusions to try and mimic these impacts that occur after games. You know, think any sort of rugby code, you know, impact sports, they're going to have a lot of contusions there, which will inevitably lead to inflammation. But even after resistance training itself, you know, the, the micro tears that um, occur in the muscle from, you know, eccentric type contractions, decelerations, if you're doing some sprint work, you know, whatever it is really, these micro tears and micro damage that occur within the muscle will attract and lead to some inflammation being formed. But what's becoming, starting to become more and more apparent is how important inflammation actually is in the initial regeneration of the muscle fibers or the damaged cells and actually starting signaling cascades for the repair and the adaptation of these cells and fibers. So some of the studies that have been done in humans have used, for example, ibuprofen as a nice, you know, relatively easy off-the-shelf type of supplement that people have been able to take, you know, a couple of hours before they've done a training session of sorts. And what we've started to see is that um, basically again, there's some complexities around timing and dosage, but briefly using anti-inflammatory um, agents such as ibuprofen can actually dampen or inhibit some of these acute signals. So there's a potential again there that if you're dampening these acute signals, then longer term, you're almost shooting yourself in the foot. You know, it's not to say that people are, are taking ibuprofen daily for you know a number of weeks. It's unlikely that they are, but it's just adding a fuel to the fire about how important inflammation can be and how we could potentially embrace it and not necessarily be trying to negate it. Um, from a cold water immersion perspective, um, a colleague of mine um, who's one I supervised during my PhD, he's recently published some work using, again, our muscle tissue from our 40-hour window, and we saw a nice, robust inflammatory response there. Mm. But from a perspective of how cold water immersion was actually potentially affecting it, we didn't, we didn't see any clear effect of cold water immersion in decreasing or delaying inflammation. So it's, it's almost going against the grain of the belief that's been around for you know, a number of, number of years. And granted, some of the literature that's out there has shown the effects of cold application on decreasing inflammation. But these studies have been, again, they've been done in animals where it's, you know, some, some things translate very easily and nicely from an animal to a human, other things don't. So my colleague's um, study, he was, his study was the first to actually directly measure inflammation in muscle after this type of um, <clears throat> therapy and exercise bout. So it's not to say that it's the be-all and end-all study because, as with everything, more and more questions are being posed as you provide some answers. But 
how much of an emphasis using cold water immersion, for example, should have on decreasing inflammation. The jury's still out there, and you know, as more and more, as more and more evidence coming out to show that it's not potentially doing as much for inflammation as people initially believe. So, the inflammation side of things, although cold water immersion may not be affecting it, so in the in regards to cold water immersion and governing adaptation. It may not be, you know, the infl- inflammatory signals may not be playing a large role there, but thinking back about inflammation itself, we may, you know, we should almost be looking to embrace it at certain yeah. times. It all also has to come down to the periodization of things, you know, embracing it pre-season or embracing it in periods where you want to get as much adaptation as possible, but then trying to, you know, be aware of it that it's required, but not necessarily too much of it. And a nice theory that's been around for a number of years that encompasses this approach is the hormesis theory. Mm. So, again, for the benefit of some of your listeners who may not be fully aware with it, of this theory, it's not only relating to inflammation. You can think about it in relation to cold, heat, antioxidants, you know, a whole host of things. And the crux of the theory is that at lower levels, these type of responses are not necessarily having an effect. In too much of a dose, they can have an, a detrimental effect. But in the right dose, so such as inflammation to carry on the theme, a certain dose of inflammation can be used beneficially. So the question then becomes how do you identify or can you identify the optimal dose of it and try and monitor that to try and keep a tap on, okay, how much of it do I need at what given stage of my athlete's preparation cycle and when does you know to, when do we get to the stage of having too much there? And then how to try and rein it back a bit. Brilliant. And you've already asked my que- answered my question of whether we should embrace or avoid inflammation. I think it's very important that you said that inflammation is a natural response to resistance exercise and can play a very important role in forcing our adaptations. Because I know there will be a lot of people that uh, take antioxidants and high high doses of antioxidants regularly because they're yeah. being told and marketed towards them that this inflammation is bad, very much like lactate has been demonized and several other things. So to take high levels of antioxidants to kind of blunt this and uh, this inflammation response, and they actually might be blunting the level of adaptation they can achieve from their training. So just from a pra- uh, practical perspective, as you said, cold water immersion might not blunt inflammation, but we know that high levels of antioxidants can have an impact on the inflammation response. And maybe this is another common practice that people who are looking to maximize their adaptation exercise may not want to engage in yeah absolutely you know you, depending on you know it depends entirely who you speak to you know for example a practitioner versus a scientist and some of the scientists for example they they can't see why what, what's all the fuss about with recovery therapies you know sometimes their belief is literally you know everything in the body happens for a reason yes it's important to understand what's going on but at the end of the day, just let the body respond as it wants to naturally, because it, that's what it's best at. It's you know fantastic, at, you know muscles very plastic in nature. You know it's fantastic at you know adapting to various types of stimuli and how quickly it can adapt to things. So sometimes the belief is about you know, we're really just overcomplicating things. You know stick yeah. and just stick to the basics of recovery and just let the body respond how it wants to. You know it's you know it's nice when someone says that it's like okay. You, a purely black and white approach, yeah. but then, you know, you can't necessarily take that as strong of a stance in a lot of situations. You know, there are more things to consider, but it inevitably boils down to how much, you know, the question of how much should we interfere with what's going on in the body? You yeah. know, how much and when, where do we draw the line in the sand in terms of when, you know, something's starting to get too much then? Yeah, exactly. And one thing I'd like to touch back on, and this, be people have a real appreciation for research as a whole, and it difficulty in translating what we see in animal models right through to human studies and as you said the level of trauma that they're able to induce within these road models is much more significant than we'd ever see within a human model i think that's an important factor that people need to understand about road models in particular in particular that when we deal with a road model we can administer doses or administer uh, interventions to levels that are much much higher super physiological levels that we wouldn't ever kind of attain within a human model so such as we see usually within drug therapies as well, we see rodents being given high, high levels of uh, a drug. And if we did that relative to their body weight and scale it up to a human level, that the levels of drugs that humans would require is just super physiological and we couldn't 
ever handle that kind of dose. So that's why we have a difficulty in extrapolating data from animal models right through to human models. Yeah, absolutely right. And the, the same thing is true to give an example in relation to, you know, cold application. Some of these animal models, yes, you know, whatever they've done, exercise or injury, it doesn't really matter. But when they've applied cold therapy to the animal, they've inevitably applied it to one very, very, very small muscle yeah. or a, a small muscle group. And they've still applied it to, say, an ice pack for, say, 10 minutes. You know, the temperature of that ice pack is inevitably the same temperature as an ice pack a human would use. But when you consider the difference in size of the muscle compared, you know, an animal compared to a human, you know, we get massive decreases in muscle temperature in an, in an animal model that we don't necessarily see in the human or certainly not all the way through the muscle. So it adds another level of complexity, like you're mentioning. And if anything, you know, it's highlighting the need of for more um, mechanistic type studies, although, you know, yes, they're difficult and expensive to implement, but they're the type of studies that are required to try and answer these mechanistic questions to, to our human models and try as best as we can to provide as much evidence-based guidelines to athletes inevitably at the end of the day to actually benefit their um, performance. Brilliant. So I think we've covered a wide range of topics today, Leon, and uh, people can take a lot of both mechanistic and practical applications away from today. So if people are looking to get in contact with you or follow your work, where are the best places to find you? Yeah, um, so um, they, can, they can follow my work, um, first of all, on over some, some of my Twitter feeds. So um, my, my Twitter handle is Leon Roberts, so double L I O N Roberts. Um, 86 and uh, on PubMed is also another nice repository for all, all my research is all, all inevitably gets peer reviewed so just searching for Leon Roberts on PubMed will also allow you to come across a lot of my work and my colleagues work as well Perfect and I'll put links to those in the show notes so everyone can find them easy so that brings us to the very yep. final question I have and that is away from the science kind of more of a mindset question and that is what is the biggest mistake that you have made that has changed the way you approach your career or your mindset as a whole? Yeah, I'm going to say when you send the list of questions through, you know, it's, this is an example of the type of question that it takes so much more time to think of a proper answer to it, yeah. right? You know, sometimes the really technical question, oh, yeah, I can easily answer yeah. them. And it's, oh, okay. actually, I've got to sit down and think about, you know, what's, you know, in, you know what's where I guess where self reflection and everything comes in. But it was, yeah, one of the more difficult questions to try and answer. But um, one of the key things that not it's that I've started to change and develop over time has been the whole approach and mindset about not being too afraid to share, really. You know, and from a, a research and applied perspective, you know, you're never working really solely as an individual. You know, it's always a team effort, whether you're working with a team of different coaches and sports scientists or different domains, you know, nutritionists, psychologists, physiologists, everyone's contributing to the same common goal. And that can also be applied to research. I remember when I was um, doing my undergraduate dissertation, which was, you know, the first instance where I had to do everything myself, you know, there's my chance to prove what I can do from a research perspective. And as that develops, you know, more and more emphasis is then placed on working collaboratively putting trust in your colleagues, putting trust into um, the other individuals that you're working with. And that's become more and more um, apparent as I have more and more involvement with supervising students, teaching students, nurturing students through the whole applied and um, academic process. So a real um, learning experience for me has been to try and not be too afraid to to take a step back from things. You know, I can't be in the lab 24-7. I can't be collecting every bit of data. I can't be doing absolutely everything. Delegating and putting trust in your colleagues, that's a key thing that <clears throat> has really changed my approach to things. You know, it's always nice to try and do everything and have an understanding of everything. And I do, from a researcher's perspective and an academic, I think it is important for people to have experience in an, a multitude of different areas, not just having too much of a blanket approach on. But at the same time, it's a team effort more often than not. So you, you shouldn't be afraid to try and incorporate, you know, team activities, letting people help you and take some of the load off as often as you can. Perfect. That's a really valuable lesson I think a lot of people can relate to and hopefully take something away from. So it was an absolute pleasure talking to you this evening, Leon. Thanks so much for coming on and discussing with me this evening.
No, no problem at all. You're absolutely welcome. Fantastic to have a good chat.